Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Giants of Faith, and we're concluding that series today, and we're going to do it with an awesome speaker. So I, I want to introduce him, and uh, so this is what I want to say real fast, okay? There's some people you meet in life that you know are special. They have, uh, they leave an imprint in your heart and in your life, okay? And so when I met our speaker today, a few years of that, a few years ago, around eight years ago, um, I knew he was an awesome person. I knew he he had something to bring to my life. Too much, so much to the point I actually saw that through his son Connor, who is a part of our youth program, and he has done amazing things with our with our youth program and things like that. And you can see his legacy in his son. Okay, so this man he is a professor at at Regent University. He teaches in um, spiritual formation in church history and there's something interesting i want to make a connection from our guest speaker today to our savior jesus okay check this out jesus (laughs) jesus loved on people dr josh loves on people jesus taught people dr josh does the same jesus lived humble dr josh does the same so this is what i want to encourage you guys with get ready for a great speaker today that I believe God is going to use to encourage your life, impact your life, and, and help you take next steps to where God wants you to be, okay? So him and his wife, Jen, have been at our church for over eight years. They serve on our dream team in, in the usher ministry, and so I'm excited for what God is going to use. Everyone give it up for Dr. Josh McMullen. Well, thank you so much, Jacob, for that very kind, overly kind introduction. So I want to thank uh, Pastor Sharon and Andy and all of the pastoral staff for giving me an opportunity to share with you this morning. It's deeply appreciated. And I get to talk about Mary to conclude this series of giants of the faith, these, these people who we can look to as models to spur us on. Um, and to make us look more like Jesus. You know, in 1994, Diana Deucer made a grilled cheese sandwich. Stick with me. Okay. Seemed like a normal day, but after taking a bite, Diana Deucer saw something in her grilled cheese staring back at her. It was the image of the Virgin Mary. So she grabbed the half-eaten sandwich, she packed it in cotton balls, she stuck it in a clear plastic case, and she kept it by her bedstand for 10 years. Uh, believing deeply that it protected her. Now, after 10 years, she said, I need to share my grilled cheese sandwich with the world. And so she put it up on eBay, and it sold for $28,000. Now, that sandwich has sparked dozens of imitators. McDonald's launched a Lincoln French fry campaign during the 2005, um, the 2005 Super Bowl. The popular show Glee uh, made a whole grilled cheese us episode in which a, a, a character found Jesus on his grilled cheese sandwich. Someone even founded a toaster company called Burnt Impressions that leaves imprints of religious symbols on your breakfast bread, in case you want that kind of thing. You know, Mary, whether on bread or medallions or in statue form or in painting form and so on and so forth, has evoked very strong emotions over the centuries. 
You know, some traditions have raised Mary up to almost divine-like status, and other traditions in response have tried to push her to the edge of biblical history, occasionally pulling her out around Christmas, but then putting her back away. Let me suggest that, that both approaches can be problematic. If we raise Mary up to almost divine-like status, then she can really no longer be an example for us to follow and to model our own lives after. But if we relegate her and push her to the edge of biblical history, we yet again miss out on what Mary has to teach us. So let me suggest to you that the Bible walks a middle pathway. We know that God calls Mary and says to Mary, blessed are you among women. This comes in the form of a prophecy through Elizabeth, Mary's cousin. And so the Bible gives extremely high honor to Mary. But the Bible also portrays a fully human Mary with weaknesses who sometimes got things wrong and even on occasion had to be corrected by Jesus, as we shall see, who had to make hard decisions in her life and had to deal with the consequences of those decisions. The Bible shows a human Mary, but who has great, great faith. And that's what this series is all about, looking at examples of faith in the scriptures, people that we can model ourselves after, people who are imperfect, people who made mistakes, people who sinned, but people who had faith that God used in amazing ways. And that's why our theme verse comes from Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And Mary is one of those people. She's in that cloud of witnesses who should encourage us and spur us on. So let's look at the beginning of Mary's story. It comes to us in Luke chapter 1, the Gospel of Luke. It's a longest section, but I think it, it, it's helpful to read the whole section to get the context. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Elizabeth, again, is Mary's cousin and the mother of John the Baptist. God sent the Gab angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. What's the immediate context for the story? What, what comes right before this story? Because it's interesting that Luke doesn't actually start his gospel with this story. That would seem the obvious choice, right? This is Mary being told that she's going to give birth to Jesus, the Messiah. But this is not where Luke starts his gospel. He actually starts it with another story, a story about Zechariah. Zechariah is a priest in Jerusalem. So he's got a very prestigious job, a, a very prestigious position. He's an older, learned man with, uh, with lots of power and prestige in amazing surroundings. This is where the story begins in Luke. And the angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah, and he says, You and your wife Elizabeth are going to have a baby. 
and that will be John the Baptist. And Zechariah's response, of course, we think that this learned man, this prestigious priest, would respond in faith, but he doesn't. He responds with doubt. He says, well, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. He doesn't display faith. He displays doubt. So Gabriel rebukes him. He rebukes him and says, because you don't believe me, you're not going to be able to speak until your son, John the Baptist, is born. And that's exactly what happens. That's how Luke starts this story. It's an interesting one. And then he goes into the story about Mary and Gabriel. And I think that Luke wants us to make a connection. He wants us to make a connection. He starts the story with a man uh, in, a, in a miraculous birth announcement from Gabriel, and then he, he shows another story of a miraculous birth announcement from Gabriel. And because we're Americans, we can think of this in terms of movies. When I think about this, I think of this a movie, right? And, you know, I can see Zachariah, this, this older, prestigious man in these amazing surroundings, the temple in Jerusalem. And if the camera were to pan out from that scene, right, it would pan out and it would rush north along Israel. It would come out from the prestigious surroundings of Jerusalem and it would rush north and it would start to focus in on a little backwater town of Nazareth. And Luke is trying to tell us something. Luke is trying to tell us something. The comparison is clear. Jerusalem is a big deal. Nazareth is not. Zechariah is well-educated. He's important. He's prestigious. Mary is not. Mary is a young teenage girl, probably 13 or 14. This was the common time for a, a woman to be married in the ancient world. Luke is trying to tell us something. Because it's not Zechariah who responds in faith. It's Mary. Luke is telling us that Christ's kingdom upends the normal pattern of the world. It upends it. It's not your education that can save you. It's not your 401k that can save you. It's not the so-called importance of your job or the size of your bank account, the fitness of your body, the trophies or the plaques that you have on the wall. None of these things can save you. Zachariah had them all. He responds in doubt. Mary, who has none of them, responds in faith. None of these things can save you. Christ alone can save you. And that offer is free and available to all people, regardless of their so-called position in the world. And what is Mary's response? It's one of faith. And this is the first point on your outline. When Mary encountered Jesus, she entrusted, she entrusted herself to God. Gabriel says to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And her response is, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. An answer of faith, whereas Zachariah's was an answer of doubt. Zachariah says, well, how can I be sure of this? My wife and I are very old. Now, Mary does say to Gabriel, right, how will this be since I'm a virgin? But I don't think this is the same response that Zechariah gives. Zechariah's is one of doubt, right? How can I be sure? I think Mary's is more about clarification, right? She's like, mm, I don't know if you know this. You're an angel. I don't know if you know how human biology works. I'm a virgin, right? <laughs> we get how there are different responses because Gabriel reacts differently. Gabriel re rebukes Zechariah. But to Mary, he answers kindly. He explains it. He says, the Lord will do this miraculous work. And what Gabriel says to Mary is, you have found favor with God. You know, that word favor here is re related to the word grace. So we can also think of this as kind of saying, God is gracing you. He's bestowing grace on you, Mary. And rather than say, well, how can I be sure? She says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. You know, in many ways, Mary is the first person to encounter Jesus and to have her life changed by that encounter. I mean, here she is encountered, encountering Jesus, um, and it's going to change her life in a radical, radical way. She encounters Jesus. She's confronted with the decision, and she responds, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. You know, that word that we translate favor here, the one that's related to grace, is found only one other place in the New Testament. 
It's found where Paul is speaking about followers of Christ in Ephesians 1. You can see that on your outline. It reads, to the praise of God's glorious grace, which he has freely given us. That's that same word he has favored us with. He has graced us with. He has bestowed grace on us through the one he loves. That is Christ Jesus. It's in Jesus we have redemption through Christ's blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished. What a wonderful word, right? Lavished. He's lavished on us. And so just like Mary, we encounter Christ, and we have a decision to make. For those of you who are not followers of Christ, maybe you're here for the first or second time, and you're just kind of checking things out. Maybe you were once a follower of Christ, and for uh, for a time, you have followed a different path. Maybe you are at the end of your rope and you're just thinking, you know, I'll, I'll check out this Jesus guy. I don't know where you're at, but I do know that when we encounter the grace of God, we have a decision to make. And I hope, like Mary, you will say, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And to receive that lavish gift of grace that we received in Christ you know, certainly following Christ, there is an initial decision to that. But for those of you who have been Christians for many years, longer than I have, you know that we have to continually say yes to Christ and what he calls us to. We have to continually check ourselves to think, am I continuing to trust and follow Christ? And as you've been believers for many years, I hope that you have grown, grown in knowledge of yourself, but also grown in your knowledge of God. Maybe you have discovered areas of weakness that you did not know that you had. Maybe there were parts of your life that you discovered there were areas of hurt that you did not know that were there. I pray that you've also discovered many strengths and talents that maybe you did not know you had when you first started following Christ. And in each of those areas, we have to be like Mary and say, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled to give those things to Christ. And so it's not just our first encounter with Christ, but it's even for long-time believers. We have to be in the habit of joining Mary and saying, I am the Lord's servant. That is the attitude, the heart that we want to foster in our lives, a willingness to entrust ourselves, our family, our finances, our dreams, our plans to Christ. And Mary models that for us. She models that for us. Now, some of you may be saying, you know, Josh, I have not actually encountered an angel recently. And if I did, I would certainly respond in faith. But let's be careful because Zechariah encountered an angel and he responded in doubt. So we need to be careful about thinking too highly of ourselves. But nevertheless, we know that Mary has a miraculous encounter. But let me suggest to you that Mary not only entrusted herself to God in miraculous things and in miraculous moments, but also in the mundane and every day. And that's the next point on your outline. Mary entrusted herself to God in the mundane and every day. You may be saying to yourself, well, how do we know this? And I, and I have to admit, I can't point you to a specific verse in the scriptures that said, Mary trusted herself to God in the mundane and every day. But we do know this, that between the encounter we just read between Mary and Gabriel, there's 30 years before the start of Jesus's ministry. 30 years between this miraculous moment and kind of the birth, if you will, of Jesus's ministry, the fruition of the calling that God had given her. 30 years of ordinary mundane, everyday life. You know, so ordinary that the Bible says almost nothing at all between the birth of Jesus and the start of his ministry. 30 years. And this has driven people with, you know, crazy with curiosity for centuries. You know, we live in a day and age, if I check Instagram or Facebook or the hundreds of other apps that are out there, I can know what a friend really had for lunch or is going to have for lunch this afternoon. You know, I, I can actually find out more about people than I really care to know. And yet, here's 30 years where we know almost nothing about the most important person who's ever walked the face of the earth. 30 years. 
It's not just our day and age that this has driven people crazy with curiosity. Uh, this has been over the centuries. In fact, in the ancient world, there was one person who was so curious that he decided, I'm going to write my own fake gospel. I'm going to be nice enough to the world to fill in all the details between Jesus' birth and his, his launching of his ministry. We call this the infancy gospel of Thomas. Now, it is a fake gospel, okay? So as I give you some examples from that gospel, you may be thinking, that doesn't sound like the Jesus I know at all. That's okay. It's not the Jesus you know. But I want to point out that people have just been driven crazy wanting to know. And so this is what this fake gospel says. He says, he, he writes about Jesus' childhood. It says, Jesus created, one thing that Jesus did was create a fountain on the Sabbath. Of course, everybody loves a good fountain. Um, but it was on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And so a Pharisee came up and he scolded the child, Jesus, and Jesus cursed him and killed him. Yeah, the person writing this clearly has some serious issues. Okay. On another occasion, another child bullies Jesus. Bullying the Son of God, it's a major no-no. As you know, you know where this is leading. Jesus curses the child, and he falls down dead. Now, the people of Nazareth are getting somewhat upset. You know, like, Jesus, you're killing everybody. Um, and so he gets upset, so he makes the whole town go blind, okay? Not the Jesus that you know, clearly, all right? Now, it's not all striking people dead. Jesus, the child Jesus, in this fake gospel, he does some healings. Um, one of my favorite is he's hanging out with Joseph in the carpentry shop, and they make a couch together, father-son bonding time. But then the customer comes, and they realize the customer is much taller than they had thought. Couch doesn't fit. So Jesus just miraculously stretches the couch. So it's very handy to have Jesus around in the carpentry shop. So if you are like, boy, I really wish that I knew about what Jesus' childhood was like, you're not the only one. There are people who have gone to great lengths, even creating fake gospels to do it. I would not suggest this, by the way, going and writing your own gospel. It's no good. So curiosity has always surrounded Jesus' childhood. But for anybody who's a parent or grandparent, an honor, an uncle, or who's been around the raising of children for any length of time knows that raising children involves a great deal of the everyday and the ordinary. There's changing diapers, there's taking kids to practice, there's reading the same story like a thousand times in a row. Um, and while Mary admittedly may never have taken Jesus to soccer practice, she would have engaged in thousands of ordinary activities in raising him. And so part of Mary's calling, her fulfilling of the mission that God had given her was often probably mundane and ordinary. You know, we don't often think about this. And because of that, we forget that a, a part of God's calling in our life is also found in the everyday, in the ordinary things of life. You know, I believe in the miraculous. I pray for the miraculous. I'm so thankful to attend a church that believes and prays for the miraculous. That's why we have ministry time. And if you've never come up to be prayed for after service, I'd encourage you to do that. You know, I believe and I'm thankful for the miraculous. Our God is a God of miracles. But you know what? He's no less the God of the mundane. He is still God in the mundane parts of our life. And he wants us to learn how to worship him in the ordinary aspects of life. He wants us to come and experience in his, his presence. And there's something very special that happens on a weekend service when we come in here and we worship together on Sunday, and I know there are moments where you just feel the tangible presence of God, you know, it's easy to forget on Monday, for those of you who get up early and go to work on, on Monday or whenever your shift is, you know sometimes you don't feel the presence of God as strongly in that moment. And yet, he is still God. He still wants to work in you, and you can still worship him through the ordinary aspects of of life. And if we look closely at the scriptures, we find that God does want to grow us in the everyday. If one of our greatest purposes in life is to look more like Jesus, and it is, then the ordinary everyday is perfect training ground to look more like Jesus. Because that's when we discover our rough edges. And it's in those moments that the Holy Spirit can work in us to begin to smooth those over. 
We can look at a few examples from the scriptures. This is just a small sampling, and they're on, provided on your outline. These are just a few that I pulled out about ordinary moments in our life where we can look more like Jesus. And I would encourage you over the next few weeks as you read your Bible, look maybe for some places that the scripture instructs you to grow in the ordinary parts of your everyday life. And maybe the Holy Spirit will grab hold of you when you read one of those and you can say, I can look more like Jesus in that. Contro controlling your tongue, even when you have annoying co-workers. The scriptures don't say that, I just added that. Working hard, even when your boss isn't watching. Listening to your boss, even when sometimes their advice is really bad. Minding your own business, rather than gossiping with your co-workers. Obeying parents for the young people in the crowd. Obeying parents is a way to honor and worship God. Being generous and willing to share. Being quick to listen and slow to speak. You know, Mary entrusted herself to God in miraculous moments. She also entrusted herself to God in the mundane, 30 years of mundane. And then Mary also entrusted herself to God when all the details were not clear. And that's the next point on your outline. Mary entrusted herself to God even when all the details were not clear. You know, when Mary said, as a 13 or 14-year-old, uh, what we would consider a girl, a woman in that, in that period, right? When she said, I am the Lord's servant, may your word to me be fulfilled. There's, there's simply no way that Mary knew what that meant fully. She didn't know all the details of that calling that she had received from God. And how do we know this? Well, we know this from two different stories in the scriptures. The first one is actually one of the only stories we have from Jesus' childhood. And it's the Holy Family. That's Mary and Joseph, Jesus, his brothers and sisters. And they live in, in the region of Galilee. And they're heading to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Celebrate Passover. They celebrate Passover. They're on their way back to Galilee. And you have to understand that people would have traveled in caravans in this period. Probably dozens of families, maybe more all traveling together because it was safer. It kept you protected along the roadways. And so it would have been easy to lose track of a child, right? Because, well, we think he's probably over there with his aunt or his uncle or whatever it may be. Three days passes, and Mary and Joseph realize that Jesus is not with the caravan. He's 12 years old, so he's only a few years away from what would have been considered manhood in this period, but nevertheless still a child. And, of course, you can imagine the anxiety that Mary and Joseph felt in that moment. Any of you who have lost a child at a mall or at an amusement park for any length of time, you know that horrible sinking feeling that you get. This is three days gone. They rush back to Jerusalem. They're looking for him, and they find him. And he's in the temple teaching the teachers. And they're amazed. They're amazed at him. And that's where we'll pick up the story in Luke 2. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Well, why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. Obedient to him. We're not really sure why Luke decides to share this particular childhood story. There's probably lots of reasons. But in the context of talking about Mary, it shows us one thing. And that is that Mary and Joseph did not understand all the details of Jesus' calling and mission. And Jesus actually gives them kind of a gentle rebuke here. He says, well, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand really what he was saying to them. You know, they didn't get the luxury of knowing all the details to how God was going to use them. They didn't. They had accepted their calling from the Lord, but there were a lot of details that they didn't know. And they just simply had to trust God. That was true for Mary. Folks, it's true for us. It is true for us. Now, if you're a parent, you may be thinking what I sometimes think when I read this story. I would kill that kid. That's what I think. Three days, and then when you show up, he's kind of like, I don't understand. What, what are you worried about? Um, but let's take a step back for a second before I get struck by lightning. Um, right? We're not raising the Son of God, first of all. But Jesus also makes it pretty clear here, right? 
He's compelled to be in his father's house. He had to be. He said, I had to be in my father's house. And we see this throughout the scriptures that Jesus says, you know, I had to do this to fulfill a prophecy or I had to do this to fulfill my father's command. Other places it says that Jesus was compelled or led by the Holy Spirit to do something. And so Luke, I think, is trying to emphasize, listen, this isn't just some rebellious preteen, okay? Uh, he is obedient to his parents, but he has a mission to fulfill, and he has to do it. He is compelled to do it. And I think that's why Luke probably ends this section by saying, right, that he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. Luke wants to really emphasize, listen, Jesus is an obedient son, Jesus is sinless. The scriptures tell us he is sinless. He is not sinning here. He's compelled. It is part of his mission that he has to fulfill. And Mary and Joseph don't get it. They don't get that part. They don't get all the details. You know, we see that again in the story of the wedding at Cana. We can pick that up in John 2. It says, on the third day, by the way, Jesus is older now. He's not long, no longer a child. He's full grown. Man, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. And Jesus, his mother, was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus, his mother, said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, I love the fact that she just kind of ignores him, right? His mother says, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. You can imagine Mary's pride, right? She gets to show off her son. Her son is a miracle worker. She wants to do this. Now is the time to show off, she says. But you know, Jesus says, no, it's not. He says, woman. And the Greek there, that's not a derogatory term. It's probably easy, best to think of that as madam or ma'am, right? Not woman, but ma'am or madam. Why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. Mary did not understand all the details of the mission and calling that God had given her. But she didn't say, well, you know, if I don't get all the details, I'm done. I'm out. You know, I'm done with what God's doing in my life. That's not what she says. And, you know, for some of you, you have may, have, may have found that you have made mistakes. You thought maybe you heard from God and, and you weren't completely clear or you've made mistakes in your life. You know what? I think it's also important to emphasize here that Jesus doesn't reject Mary either. She doesn't get all the details, but there is a calling on her life, and she is not rejected by God. You know, no one seemed to get Jesus' mission. It's not just Mary. His disciples are consistently clueless, almost comically clueless throughout the scriptures. No one seemed to understand that Christ's calling was to the cross to become a sacrifice for sin to make a, a way for lost people to find their way home for orphans to become sons and daughters of the most high god we do not know all the details of where god is leading us but we do know that his ultimate mission in our lives is that we glorify him we look more like jesus and ultimately we enjoy perfect joy and peace with him forever. And we get to do that because Christ fulfilled his mission. He goes to the cross and all of his disciples, all of his disciples except one, his best friend John, scatter. They run. But you know who does not run? Mary. She is there. She is there at the foot of the cross. You know, we read in John 19, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister. Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, that's his best friend John, standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, madam, ma'am, here is your son. And to John, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. And that leads to our final point. When Mary entrusted herself to God, he was faithful to care for her. You know, in the midst of his own suffering, in the midst of his own suffering, not just physical suffering, but the spiritual suffering of separation from God, the unbelievable suffering that he took by taking on our guilt and our sin, experiencing all of that. Even in the midst of that, Jesus took time to comfort his mother. 
And he does this by asking his best friend, John, to take care of her. You know, and this should encourage every follower of Christ. Why? Because we, like Mary, are also part of Christ's family. How do we know this? Because he tells us in his own teaching. You know, in Matthew 12, Jesus is sitting in a house and he's teaching. And somebody comes into the house and he says, Jesus, you know, your mother and your brothers are outside waiting for you. And Jesus says, well, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And of course, everybody in the house is like, I don't, I don't get what you're saying. It's very typical. So he explains it. In Matthew 12, he says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. And if you are a follower of Christ, then you are counted with Mary. Jesus himself says it. You are part of his family. And certainly that does not mean that we are free from all suffering or struggle or pain. It's clear that Mary watching her own son dying was extremely painful. But in the midst of that, Jesus takes time to comfort her. You know, Jesus had brothers. He had brothers. We don't know why Jesus did not instruct one of his half-brothers to take care of his mother. But he instructs his friend John, his best friend John, to do it. So for whatever reason, Jesus places care or places Mary in the care of John. And you know, a new type of family in that moment is born. Not of genetics, not of blood, but of faith, a spiritual family. And we see this emphasized again in the book of Acts. Luke writing in the book of Acts, he's talking about the Christians. This is after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. And he says this, they, all the Christians, join together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. I think it's interesting that Luke takes the time to point out Mary's presence here specifically. I think it illustrates that Mary is now part of a new family, a spiritual family, that her needs were being met because he cared for her. Certainly her physical needs because the early church, church took care of widows, but more importantly, her spiritual needs because God cared for her. She had entrusted herself to God. She entrusted herself to God in miraculous moments, but she also entrusted herself to God in the mundane and every day. And she entrusted herself to God even when all the details weren't clear. And you know what? Sometimes she got it wrong, just like you and me. And she entrusted herself to God because she was confident that God would be faithful to her. And he was. Because he cared for her. And he cares for you. We have a faithful God, my friends. And you can entrust yourself to him, your dreams, your family, the mundane, the ordinary parts of life. Let's pray. Father God, you have lavish, lavished grace on us in your son. And we are grateful and we are thankful. Lord, let the cry of our hearts be, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. In those miraculous moments when you come in powerful ways, Lord, we are thankful and we pray more for the miraculous. We pray that we would have greater faith in those moments. But Lord, we also pray that we would have faith on Monday morning when life is hard and life is tough, that you would shape us and form us. Lord, we also pray that you would help us to be confident in your mercy when all the details are not clear to us. And we are thankful that you are a faithful God. And if you have never encountered Christ, or maybe you've encountered him and you spent weeks or months or years away from him, I wanna give you an opportunity to pray with me to just place your, your trust in God. So I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand or stand up or come forward. But you can just pray this prayer with me in your heart. Father God, I thank you for your son Jesus. I thank you that you lavish your grace on me, that you favor me. Help me to trust in you. Help me to trust in you, to begin to follow your ways, confident that you will transform and change me, confident that you will be there for me, confident that you will lead me home to spend eternity in perfect peace and joy with you. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. 
You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.